I'm just sitting here wondering how long we're going to act like we don't remember Mike Miski offering $5,000 for anyone who could help find a stolen Rolex. I met Johnny Frazier once and Caleb Miski. Halloween 2014. I'd been a cop for a couple years by then. I worked on the ATV unit in town, District 1. But that night, I was working the Halloween event in Waikiki. That's District 6, and they need all the help they can get that night. What they do is they block off the streets. It gets pretty wild. So I was down there doing crowd control, and I run into a good friend. And she introduced me to a few people that night. Little did I know at the time, two of those people were Johnny Frazier and Caleb Miski. Two weeks later, November 13th, 2014, Mike Miski posts on social media. He was offering a $5,000 reward to anyone that could help find his stolen Rolex. And I know some of you even took a screenshot. Everyone was sharing it on Instagram. This is before stories, so it would have been a post. I might even Venmo $100 to the first person who can send me the original post. And I'm sure there's a story behind it too, you know? Out there, somewhere. If I'm writing a story, it probably goes like this. 12 months before the accident. Yeah, that accident. Caleb is living his final 12 months of his life, but he doesn't know it. His girlfriend doesn't know it. John doesn't know it. Nobody knows it. John Frazier and his girlfriend, Ashley, they're split in an apartment with Caleb Miski and his girlfriend, Delia. They're in Waipahu at the Oasis townhomes. Everything seems to be going well. Johnny and Caleb are best friends. They've both got beautiful girlfriends and each couple has a dog. So you've got four 20 something year olds and two dogs living in a place together. And Caleb's making so much money at Madsen. He's paying all the bills. He's paying for all the food. He's paying for people's gas money. Everybody loves the kid. I've always heard from friends of Caleb that he didn't really want anything to do with his dad, Mike. It seems like Caleb always looked at Mike like he was no good. I had heard that Caleb even moved to Alaska to get away from his dad. He was gone for like a year or something, in my story. Ashley and John, they stop for gas one day at the Chevron in Kailua. As they're pulling in, Ashley sees Caleb. She hasn't seen him in a while, he was in Alaska. And they had known each other from before he left. It was actually Ashley that introduced Caleb and John. And those two were like two peas in a pod, the best of friends. All right, so John and Caleb, they're really into cars. John's a gearhead, he's always driving bikes, Honda Civics, joining car clubs. One day, after a drink in the night before, John, who's wearing a construction t-shirt and shorts, slippers, no helmet, he drives his bike into Kaneohe to sell it. And Ashley was following John in the car behind him. Now, while they're heading north shore bound on the Kahakili, John gets ready to make a right turn on a Kauhipa when the truck in front of him slams on its brakes. John didn't have rear brakes on his bike at the time. Normally, he would have just tapped the front brakes and then looked for a line to get out of the way. But he'd been drinking the night before. Probably still hung over. He slams on the front brakes, hoolies over his handlebars, hits the ground right in front of his girlfriend. And it was bad. John had smacked his head on the ground and he had really bad road rash. His girl really wanted to take him to the hospital, but John just wouldn't go. He hated hospitals. So she tried and tried, but he just refused. He had hit his head so hard that when he woke up the next morning, he didn't even know who his best friend Caleb was. So when that happened, Ashley didn't give him a choice. She took him to the hospital. Johnny's hurt now. So he's got to quit his job. He can't work. So now Caleb is the only one working. So they had to figure something out. They wanted out of their lease over at Oasis, but their landlord wouldn't let them out of the contract. So they stopped paying the rent and eventually they get evicted. So they got no place to stay. Caleb doesn't want to go stay with his dad. Caleb even shows up with a Kama Aina Termite and Pest Control flatbed truck with pop-up tents in the back. He would have rather lived in a tent with his friends than with Mike. That didn't last long though. Caleb works out some kind of deal with his dad. All four of them can stay in the Kama Aina Termite and Pest Control offices on Queen Street when it's closed. It's got AC, it's got bathrooms, it's got couches. And now remember, in our little story here, both couples have dogs. So they can stay at the offices, but that's not exactly good for business. Now it's gotta be hard to run a criminal racketeering organization involving murder, kidnapping, robbery, extortion, drug trafficking, while four basically teenagers are always hanging around the office with their dogs. So Mike tells them, listen, you gotta leave during the day. You gotta take the dogs with you, because this is a business. And to be honest, they don't really have much of a choice right now. So it is what it is. Well, at night, they sleep on the carpet and the couches. But during the day, they gotta 
gotta go somewhere. So they go hang out at friends' houses. They go run errands, do laundry, go grocery shopping, the things everybody's gotta do. But then they return to the offices at night. Can you imagine the things that those four see in here every night at those offices? But this is just a short-term operation. It's temporary. So they develop a plan. The plan is they're all gonna get a place together. Ashley has these really good friends. It's a couple. They basically hanide these four during this whole process. All right, so for the story, let's call them Charmaine and Kalani. They're really good people. So Charmaine and Kalani let the four stay at their house with them during the day. This way they could have somewhat normal lives. They had dogs too, so all the dogs could play together in a real yard. They don't have to be cooped up all day. But while they're hanging out, they start getting close. And Johnny and Ashley start telling Charmaine and Kalani all the crazy things that they've been seeing about how Mike's smuggling drugs in his fish boat. It's hella sketchy over there. It's hard to sleep. It's hard to shower. It's hard to get a job. And I'm sure they're all getting on each other's nerves too because if you live with somebody for so long, especially in tight quarters in Hawaii when nobody's got any room, you know how that happens. But Caleb and Delia, they started working a lot. So they weren't there as much as Ashley and John were. Caleb and Delia, they find this place in Kalihi and they decide that just them two are going to move into this place together. So Charmaine and Kalani, they just decide to let John and Ashley start staying the night at their house. Basically, they move in with them. This way they can just get away from all that sketchy stuff that's happening at the office. And then they can focus on getting jobs and finding a place to get back on their feet. So John and Ashley, they move in permanently with Charmaine and Kalani. So for John and Ashley, life's easier, probably safer, right? I mean, right? Things should be a lot better for them. If it was only that easy, and it might have been, except for one small problem, John, freaking John. He's a hustler. He would buy things, fix them up, sell them, shoes, speakers, dive gear, cars, jewelry. Well, John, he sees some jewelry over at Mike's offices. So this kid decides that he's gonna take a little something with him. And Mike's rich. He's not even gonna know this stuff's missing, right? So he grabs the jewelry. Well, one of those pieces of jewelry was a watch, a Rolex watch. And Johnny, he just doesn't realize what he's getting himself into. Now, the watch was old. It was beat up, scratched, and it probably wasn't all that expensive. It wasn't that rare. Sure, it's a Rolex, but to Mike, it's probably just another piece of jewelry, you know? Well, it wasn't just another watch to Mike. That was Mike's first Rolex. It was special to him. Maybe his grandpa gave it to him or something. It was only worth a few thousand dollars, but to Mike, it was irreplaceable. For whatever reason, in this story, Mike loved that watch. But now, John's got it. So when John and Ashley, they move in full-time over at Charmaine and Kalani's, John doesn't tell anybody that he took the watch. Kalani and Charmaine, they take these two in, they're like cooking them dinner, they letting them shower. I mean, they basically have a normal life. Kalani even lets John wear his gold chain that he got from his grandpa. I mean, they really took care of these two, Hawaiian style. So Johnny's got this watch, and now he's gotta go make some money. He's gotta get him and his dog and his girl into an apartment so they got a place to stay, something they can call their own. So John tells Charmaine that his uncle gave him some jewelry and he wants to sell it. So Charmaine calls over at her friend who owns an actual legit jewelry store on Smith Street in town. So he shows Charmaine the Rolex. He says it was his grandpa's or something. Charmaine sees the Rolex and says, you know what, my friend might be interested in this. I think this is the only thing really worth anything. Charmaine calls her friend, says, hey, I got this kid who's got this Rolex that he wants to sell. Are you interested? She says, yeah, no doubt. So Charmaine sets up a meeting and John brings the Roly. The jeweler offers him $3,400 for the Rolex and he takes it. But within a week, Mike Miski realizes his watch is missing. He looks everywhere, asks everybody. So Mike, in a panic, posts on social media, my watch is missing, does anybody know anything? Of course, nobody knows. Not only did nobody see Johnny take it, but he didn't tell anybody. But Caleb, Delia, Charmaine, Ashley, they're asking Johnny, did you take the watch? He says, no, I didn't take it. He denies it the whole time. Ashley actually didn't really believe John, but he denied it anyways. So Mike posts a reward, a bounty, if you will. $5,000 for anybody who can help me get my watch back. All of a sudden, word starts to spread because money talks. Even the big local social media accounts post about it. And now everybody's talking. Everybody knows Mike Miski got his watch stolen and he's offering $5,000. Now within a week, word makes it back to the jeweler who bought this watch from Johnny. So the jeweler calls up Charmaine. Yo, I think this is the watch. I think the watch that John sold me is the watch Mike's looking for. Mike's posting $5,000 for a reward to return this watch. I don't think it's worth the drama. 
So she says, I think I'm going to call Mike, take the $5,000 reward and give him his watch back. Remember she paid 3,400 for it. The jeweler calls up Mike Miskey, says, Hey, I think I got your watch. She said, I bought it last week from some kid who said his uncle gave it to him. So Mike's like, okay, bring the watch. I'll bring you the 5,000. And Mike agrees to meet up with the jeweler. But as soon as they get there, Mike grabs this woman by her neck and chokes her out. He interrogates her and asks her about who sold the watch. She says, I don't know any names. Mike pulls out a picture of John and Ashley. Yeah, that's the dude, she says. Mike never pays the reward of that chick. He just leaves her shook, takes the watch. And now Mike, he's on the hunt. So Caleb and John, they're not really talking as much because Caleb's got his own apartment with Delia. He's got a job. She's pregnant. They're just doing their own thing. They're trying to get stuff ready. So they're not really talking as much as they used to. So Mike now turns his attention to finding John Frazier. Even though he got his watch back, now it's time for revenge. Johnny's got to pay for what he did. And Charmaine and Kalani, they have no idea what's about to happen. So Mike, he takes that $5,000 Rolex reward. He puts it to another use. Mike's willing to pay $5,000 to anybody willing to deliver up John Frazier. The word spreads all over. Well, about two months after John took Mike's Rolex, John decides he's going to sell his Honda Civic. He needs money. So he posts the Civic on Craigslist. Now there's this kid who knows John and for the sake of this story, let's call him Dan. Dan hears that John's trying to sell his car. Dan knows that Mike Miskey is offering money to deliver John. What better way to set him up, right? Quick 5,000. Dan calls Johnny up. Yo, I heard you selling your Honda. Can I come by and take a look? Yeah, for sure. Johnny's got no idea. So John gives Dan the address to Charmaine's house. They were living at the corner of Kuakini and Lanakila in Kalihi. So while he's waiting to meet up with Dan to sell the car, John asked Ashley to run up to Napa Auto Parts to go buy him something for the car. So Charmaine, she's got a little baby. She offers to drive Ashley up to Napa Auto Parts. All right, so you got Charmaine driving the car, Ashley's riding shoddy, and the baby's in the car seat in the back. When Dan shows up to look at the car, Ashley, Charmaine, and the baby are gone. But Dan wants to test drive the car. He makes a few passes. Of course, he's gassing it, revving the engine, trying to give it a good test. Well, after a few minutes, the girls come back from Napa Auto Parts. As they pull in, they actually see Dan driving the car. And Ashley actually knows Dan. So as the girls pull in, Ashley sees Dan driving John's car. And she's like, yo, what's up, Dan? So just then, as the girls are pulling into the house, Dan is making a turn in front of the house. And then he gasses it. Snap, breaks the axle. Something crazy pops. Something bad happened to the car. The girls heard it. I mean, it was loud. So the car's broken. Test drives Paul. The car mysteriously breaks down 150 feet from the house that John's staying at with Charmaine and Kalani. So the car now is sitting on Kukini Street. They can't get it working. Something's wrong with it. Wrong enough to keep both Dan and Johnny out there looking at it, trying to fix it. Dan's out there. Johnny's under the hood trying to figure out what's going on. Some people might say that Dan did something to the car to stall so that Johnny would be stuck, unprepared. John just didn't know what was about to happen. All right, so the girls, they pull in, they park their car. Charmaine grabs her baby and they start walking across the street to see what's wrong with the car. All right, and then Kalani, who's in the house, he sees they're having trouble too, so he comes out. Kalani's a gearhead, he races cars too. So he starts to walk the 150 feet to go help Johnny out. Just then, as they get to the street, they look up. None other than Mike Miskey himself rolls up all quick in a big base truck and three 40-year-old goons hop out of the truck. Let's call them Richard, Roger, and Russell. The thing is, Ashley actually knows these guys. Russell, he lived in Kalihi Valley. He worked at Matson with Caleb. And Roger, his daughter, played softball with Ashley's sister. I mean, they know each other's family. They hop out of the truck, they see Ashley and Charmaine. They're like, yo, where's Johnny? They look down the street. They see Johnny working on the car. Johnny looks up, he sees the dudes. He knows what time it is. So he digs and they start after him. They're wearing black shorts, black t-shirts and slippers. John runs so far that Charmaine, Kalani, them, they can't even see where he went. So Dan, the innocent car buyer, of course he digs out. He did what he came to do. Two of the goons chase after John on foot. One of the guys jumps in John's car to take it, doesn't realize that it's broken. And now while all of this was happening, the girls run back in the house and call 911. Meanwhile, the goons actually catch John all by himself. Now Russell gets to him first, but John slips him and he starts running towards Lilyha Bakery. It even looks like John might get away, but Roger grabs onto him. Of course, they start working John. Dan weasels his way back to that car that he drove up in and digs out. Job well done. Time to collect his $5,000. Well, they beat Johnny that day. Three grown men beat that boy. They actually punched the tooth right out of his 19 year old mouth. They even snatched that gold chain that was around his neck that belonged to Kalani. That was a family piece of jewelry. 
During the scramble, Johnny ends up getting away. He's alive, but he's beaten. Knowing that the cops were probably on their way, Mike rolls up, the three goons jump in his car, and they dig. The police did show up after Mike them dug out. The ambulance rolls up, and Johnny gets treated at the scene. Charmaine makes the police report. Now, Johnny thought that they were sending a message. He thought he'd got the message. Message received. He'd learned his lesson. But this was just the beginning. The beginning of Mike's hatred towards Johnny. This was the beginning of the end for John Frazier.